everybody. Again, so glad that you're here today. If you brought a copy of Scripture with you, turn to the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. We have been going through this amazing transfixing gospel uh, throughout the uh, year 2022. We began the first Sunday uh, of the new year uh, going through the gospel. As I've shared with you, just lifting the, the hood and letting you look in my engine, I've always wanted to do this. In 28 years of vocational ministry, I've never just taken the time to preach through an entire book. And so I appreciate you uh, linking your boxcar onto mine as we take this journey together. I hope you're enjoying this as much as I am. And uh, we're learning new things about the Lord. And we're learning not only about what the Lord likes, which by the way, as his ambassadors, we should also like the things that he demands and commands, the things that he corrects uh, as he adjusts and he edits our theology. And so we're just tracking along with Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. As I mentioned before, Mark is the shortest of the four Gospels. Mark is a Gospel that is moving. You find in the Gospel of Mark the word and, repeatedly, 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 the word immediately, uh, immediately, and uh, very, very frequently throughout the Gospel. And it's very common here to understand that this young writer is moving towards something. These are amazing events. These are learning events. These are things by the Holy Spirit that are recorded for our benefit. But ultimately, we see that Mark is just kind of moving things along. It's going somewhere. And we, because we get to read the end of the book, we know where it's going. It's moving towards a Roman cross. And so here, Mark, who is writing to non-Jews, Gentiles, is telling us about the lordship of Jesus Christ, his plan for us, and today, we're going to learn about God's universal love for all people. If you're with us last week, we talked about through a, a confrontation that Jesus had with some religious elitists back in the day, that Jesus taught that there are no longer any clean and unclean foods. Spoiler alert, today in this amazing miracle that Jesus is going to perform here in Mark 7, beginning with verse 24, He's going to teach that there are no clean and unclean people. Now, we know by sin that we are initially unclean before the Lord. But the good news is, and I think this is what most of us get here today, or those watching online, is that through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, no matter who you are, Jew or non-Jew, you can be declared clean this morning. And that's a beautiful, beautiful hope and a beautiful reality that comes through a bloody cross and an empty tomb. I read a quote this week from, uh, from a great preacher of old, Charles Spurgeon. I'm sure you've heard his name. Spurgeon said this. He said, I have a great need for Christ. I have a great Christ for my need. How very, very appropriate. I think we could all agree with that. And today we're going to find the most unlikely candidate of God's amazing grace, of God's amazing mercy. And in this, we're going to kind of learn that, that he is truly the Savior of the world. For God so loved the world. And we're going to learn, and hopefully today, you're going to derive perhaps a, an extra heaping helping of hope today. That no matter who you are, no matter where you're from, no matter what side of the tracks you grew up on, is that Jesus is for you. That Jesus loves you. And that he has a grace and he has a mercy for you. Some of you would say, well, what's the difference? I use those terms uh, you know, synonymously and interchangeably. Grace is God giving you what you don't deserve. Aren't you glad for the grace of God through Jesus Christ? But mercy is God keeping you from the punishment that you do deserve. And I'll take both of those things from God, by the way. Thank you very much. And today we're going to see his grace, we're going to see his mercy in the most beautiful, beautiful way. And I think in a way that hopefully... Uh, you'll leave here, you'll think about the message, and hopefully more than anything, it will inspire you and it will absolutely encourage you. Scripture makes it emphatically clear that Jesus was a Jew. Jesus was a, a Jew. Jesus was born in the homeland of Israel. He was raised in the Jewish faith. He studied the Jewish scriptures. He worshiped in the Jewish synagogues. He attended the Jewish festivals and abided by the Jewish traditions. He was raised by Jewish parents. All of his relatives were Jewish. Jesus was 
By election, he was a, a Jew. We also know and believe emphatically clear, based on Old Testament scriptures and by the evidence of his miracle working and all the things that he did while he was here in his 33-year earthly ministry, that Jesus was also the Jewish Messiah, the one that was foretold long, long, long ago, the great heavenly deliverer that would come, that would come and deliver Israel, that would, that would break the chains of oppression. Now, most Jews, by the time Jesus is actually born and shows up, most of them, by then, were thinking, oh, he's going to be a political personality. He's going to be a, a West Point grad, or perhaps a, a military personality who is going to break the chains of this Roman Roman oppression off of our lives, that we won't have to pay those taxes for everywhere that we go and, and all of these things. And, and, and yet we find that Jesus is not what they expect. <laughs> Jesus is born in Podunk, Nazareth. I mean, what good can come from Nazareth, right? That, that Jesus comes and, and he doesn't come with a, a militaristic kind of a mindset or, or a political thing. He's not born in a palace. He's not hanging out with the mayor. He's not hanging out with the governor. He doesn't have a, a yacht club membership by any means. Instead, he likes hanging out with people who are pushed to the margins of society. He's not what they want. And because of that, they're very, very quick to put him on a cross. See, he is Jewish, and yet Jesus is hanging out with non-Jewish people. Jesus is doing everything wrong. And we eventually want to take this Jesus out of the picture, and eventually they do. If you can, in respect for the Word of God, I'd love for you to stand. We're going to read our text today. It comes from Mark chapter 7, 24 through 30. Read it with me. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as he had, they, she had heard about him, a woman whose little girl, daughter, was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. God bless you. You may be seated. Mark tells us that this takes place in a place called Tyre. If you're a, a Bible student, you know that typically the city of Tyre is, usually has a, 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 another city that's tied with it called Sidon. Tyre and Sidon, Tyre and Sidon. And we read about that in the Old Testament. And, and here, we're reading that Jesus is in Tyre. This is about 35 miles northwest of, of the northern crown of the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum, again, where he set up his headquarters. And what's wild about this is, is that Tyre is on the coast of the Mediterranean. It's in a region called Phoenicia, modern-day Lebanon. Now, back in Jesus' day, because it was coastal and a lot of trade was happening there, it was a place that was filled with paganism and idolatry. You had people coming here to these ports, making these trades, intermingling with each other, and not only were services and goods being, being traded with each other, but also worldviews, also religions. And in the middle of that was a lot of idol worship. And here we find, of all people... In this pagan place, Jesus. It's the only time, how many trivia buffs do we have here? You like trivia, you like to play the trivia games? What, two people, that's it, really? Okay, uh, how many real people came to church today? Okay, all right, cool, cool. And uh, uh, here, this is the only place in Scripture, the four Gospels, where we find Jesus outside of the Israel homeland. So he has gone there. Why has he gone there? Well, most agree, answer, is rest and refreshment. <laughs> Jesus was fully God and fully human. 
I love the scriptures where it talks about Jesus getting hungry. I love those scriptures where references is he's tired, he gets in the bow of the boat, and he's sleeping. I love those parts where he gets thirsty at midday, he sits down by a well, the boys are off getting food, and he strikes up a conversation with a woman. I love those kind of scriptures. And most agree that Jesus has left what we now know as the country of Israel. He's now gone up away from that place, and he's there to do what? Get some rest. How many of you know Jesus needed to rest? If you've been with us the last several Sundays, we have been going from episode to episode to episode. And just as he finishes this episode, he needs a little R&R. He takes the disciples away with him. And then a crowd follows him. Are you tracking with this? All of what's going on here. And so he immediately says, boys, you go do this. I see them. They're like sheep without a shepherd. I'm going to minister to these guys. He has not stopped ministering in the last five Sundays that you and I have been together. Is it any wonder, being fully human, that somehow, man, I just kind of need to get away. I'm, I'm not leaving the mission, but there's times where I just need to check out. Any real people, anybody ever need those times? Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good ovation right there. <laughs> Sounds like real people. We all need some rest. We all need some refreshment, don't we? We all sometimes just kind of have to say, okay, TV timeout. I'm going to pull over on the side of the road. I'm just got, I just need to put my feet in the sand a little bit. I just need to put the phone off of the hook for a while. That's an old reference. I just need to. <laughs> I just need a little bit of me time. And, and so Jesus here is just trying to get a little bit of me. And who can blame him? Everywhere he goes, people are following him. In a modern context, as we deal with the cult of personality, and we deal with celebrities, this is kind of like a whole paparazzi kind of thing going on. Everywhere big celebrities go or famous political people go, there's crowds following them and agencies and photographers and fans and critics and everybody. And Jesus, his reputation is a miracle worker has gone beyond the boundary of Israel. Because once he gets to tire to get a little bit of me time, this woman finds him. This woman, what do we know about this woman? Scripture says she is Greek. What does that mean? It doesn't mean she was born in Greece, but it does infer that she speaks Greece. She's from this area in which Jesus has found himself, where Jesus has gone to, to rest. And, and, and she's from there. She's a local girl. She's from a region that's been Hellenized many, many years before by Alexander the Great and the Greek culture, and so she's well immersed in that, but she's also a local-born girl. She's a, a Syrian Phoenician woman. At the end of the day, she is a Gentile. That's what I want you to get from all that. She's a Gentile, okay? So not only is she a woman back in that day, the polar opposite of, of Jesus, he's a man, she's a woman, she is a Gentile, he is a Jew, but we also find out in our, our text today, she's a mom, isn't she? She's a mom. She has a young daughter, and this young daughter is demonically oppressed. Now, I know this, after having nine kids, <laughs> is that there is nothing that will stop you from getting the help your kids need. There is nothing. If my kid is in trouble, if any of my kids are in trouble, there is nothing that will stop me or Michelle from going and getting the need, whatever, we have, whatever the cost, whatever the inconvenience that is. How many of you say that's a pretty good encapsulation definition of parenthood? Inconvenience, and uh, <laughs> inconvenience we love, we're grateful for, but, but, but there is nothing she won't do. And so she hears that Jesus has shown up in her hometown. And so what does she do? She goes, she shows great humility. She shows great interdependence on him. She shows great faith in a pagan place, in a woman who doesn't have the background. that she, she goes to him, and she falls at his feet, and she begs him, please deliver my daughter from this situation. It's Jesus' response that messes us up. If you don't know better, if you don't go a little bit deeper into the textual fabric, you will think Jesus is the most 
unlike Jesus that you've ever experienced him before. Initially, just on a casual reading, you're going to see and think, he is so indifferent. He is so rude. Here is a woman. Here is a mother. And he is dishonoring her. I mean, here she is, this poor thing, and, and she's just in this place of torment. Her, her child is suffering, and, and, and here she sees the answer, and, and, and nothing's going to stop her, and she's going to do whatever it is, and she's just going to just nosedive at his feet and ask him to deliver her daughter, not caring their differences. This is the mother's love. This is also a tenacious and a persisting faith and Jesus has the audacity to say this to her which 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 blows me away he says first let the children eat all they want what children eating huh as stated Jesus was the Jewish Messiah Jesus was the Jewish Messiah he came specifically as a Jew for the Jews initially. By God's plan, God's plan, God's plan of salvation, God's plan of deliverance from 35,000 feet, when we look at it theologically, the Messiah was to come first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. Matter of fact, Paul writes about it in Romans 1.16. Often I'll quote this, and sometimes I leave off the last part, and it's the part I want you to highlight today. Romans 1.16, Paul says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Anybody else say that today? I'm unashamed of the gospel. That was weak. Um, for I'm not, <laughs> I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. And then this is the part B. Here's the part I want you to get. First to the Jew then to the Gentile, okay? So this is the plan. This is the plan. Jesus is coming through Jewish lineage. Jesus is coming as Messiah, promised Messiah, to the Jewish people to bring deliverance first to them. They are going to reject that. Therefore, then the plan of deliverance will be gladly accepted, craved by the Gentiles. And then Romans tells us a little bit later on, spoiler alert, that someday the veil will come off. Bible says that the Jews will see him who they pierced, and there will be a Jewish revival. So the plan is first to the Jew, then to the Gentiles. And so now, the first part of how Jesus responds makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. So now what he's basically saying is, listen, friend, it's not your turn yet. It's not your turn yet. The, the children are the, the Jews. They're God's children. And, and they're at a table, and, and this blessing, this plan, this salvation is first going to go to them. It's preparing food. I'm looking at my daughter, Sarah. Sarah, you didn't know you are going to be a sermon illustration here today. How blessed I am to have three daughters just right here. I love you guys so much. This is cool. Um, and she's got three beautiful little children. Um, and, and so I would assume, knowing being in Sarah's house, is when she prepares food, she's preparing food specifically for our three grandkids, right? But perhaps, hypothetically, she's got a pet. She's got a, a dog in this case, okay? And now if we went over there and we said, what are you doing, Sarah? And Sarah says, man, I'm preparing food right, for, you know, for Bennett, for Claire, for Owen, and then she prepares this food specifically for their likes and tastes, and then after that food is ready, she takes it off of the burner, she comes over, and she starts feeding it directly to the dog under the table. How many of you would say, that's backwards? <laughs> that's backwards. How many dog people do we have here today? Right on. Right on. Dog people, right? How many cat people do we have here today? We're, we're going we're to have an a altar call in a little while for you guys. And uh, no, we have a cat too. I'm in that, that fraternity uh, as well. But, 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 but you, would you say, man, that's, that's kind of odd. Uh, it was for the kids. Uh, and yet when it's all ready, she gives it to the dog under the table for the dog to eat all it wants. 
And then whatever's left over, you'll just let the three kids just fight over that. There's something backwards here. Jesus is telling her through that initial statement, he's saying, listen, uh, let, the, let the children eat all they want first. Let Israel, let the children here take all that they want first. And the plan is that eventually it's going to go to the dog. Here's the problem with that. Most people who don't go a little bit deeper into Scripture think, Jesus, you don't call a woman a dog for crying out loud. Here's this poor woman advocating, pleading desperately for her demon-possessed little girl. Can you imagine what a nightmare that is? And Jesus makes a reference to a dog? If you would have lived 2,000 years ago, or before, even in Old Testament references, that was the worst thing you could call somebody. Why? Because most of the dogs were street dogs. Most of the dogs were out there in the middle of the street. They were dirty, they were dusty, many of them had diseases. Oftentimes you'd find carcasses of, of dead dogs. If, I if you really want to get grossed out, uh, at the city dump, Dogs would roam in and out. They would take care of all the refuge. They would consume it. Even victims of crucifixion were consumed by dogs. This is atrocious. And here Jesus is telling this poor lady, hey, food is prepared for, for the Jewish people. It's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. But here's where we have to go a little bit deeper. See, as I've told you many times, the language of the New Testament Koine Greek was very, very specific. And the reference to the dogs is in reference to little dogs, domesticated dogs, right? Puppies, lap dogs, not street dogs, not insulting street dogs, but instead, Household dogs, and there were some of those, not like in America in 2022, but they did have dogs that were inside, and they were typically smaller dogs. And so here, what he's saying is, is that, yes, I have come as the Jewish Messiah, that I'm coming first to the Jews, my grace, my mercy, all the things the Messiah is to do is initially, ultimately, comes through the Jews, however, however, it is going to then go to you. Now, with that second part about the dogs, this was a test for her. I think a lot of people today would probably say, guess it just wasn't meant to be. Guess, I guess maybe I got it wrong. I, I'm just going home. My timing was off with it. I think a lot of people would just give up at that point. But what's so amazing about this mom, I mean, God gave you mom something so, so special. And she takes that very, very word picture, children sitting at a table, and she flips it around on him. And in the most beautiful way, that shows this persevering kind of a faith. She flips it around, and, 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 and so here, she, this huge test, we find that faith perseveres. Guys, faith is to persevere. The kind of faith that God is looking for in your life and mine is a persevering faith. Sometimes we pray a little prayer. We have a legitimate need. We pray a little mamby-pamby prayer, you know? And then we like, okay, well, God heard it, and that's enough. But here we find that God is moved by persistent faith. Jesus told a story of a widow. Remember the widow? She, she's looking for justice. She goes to a judge. The judge doesn't even have any regard for God. But, but what, what does the guy eventually do? He gives this poor widow who has no rights, no income, no standing in the, in the, in the community. And, and why does he finally give her what she wants? Who is it? It's the widow. Ugh. Go away. Next day, look through the window. Who is it? God's that widow. Go away. And Jesus tells a story 
that she eventually gets what she wants. Why? Because she's persistent. She knows the judge is the only one who can help her. She doesn't just give up. Jesus honors and commends persevering faith. Ask, seek, knock. Ask, seek, knock. Ask and it will be given to you. Knock and the door will be open to you. Right? Knock. The door will be open to you. Seek and you shall find. Man, is that your prayer? Would that characterize me today? Well, I don't need to keep knocking on the door. I mean, he knows me. He knows the request. I already asked once. Or do we tenaciously exercise our faith muscles and go to him, recognizing just like this woman, God, you're the only one who can help me here. Doctors can't help me in this situation right now. Nobody's willing to loan me any money right now. I've got a child who's on the other side of the United States and living like this crazy, crazy life. God, you're the only one who can help me. And I'm not just going to ask you some mamby-pamby way. I'm going I'm to fall down at your feet because you're the only hope I've got. What's your biggest need today? Are you falling down at the feet of the Lord? Is there desperation? Is there desperation? Do you have a persevering faith? I'm just not going to let go of the horns of the altar. God, you're it. I'm not letting go. I'm going to keep coming to you. You're my only hope. See, faith, faith perseveres. And this woman would not give up. And she responds, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. What a response. At that moment, if this was a modern context, I would just, she would just drop the mic. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Lord, even the dogs, even the dogs eat a crumb now and then. Even whatever falls over the side of the table. It is a remarkable response. Why is it remarkable? First of all, she calls him Lord. The only time, trivia buffs again, the only time Jesus is called Lord in the book of Mark, 66 chapters, is this time. By who? A Gentile, living in Gentile land. Wow. How about that? How about that? She acknowledges him as Lord. But I think there's a second thing that's so remarkable about her, her, her answer to him, the way she reframes that word picture, is she understands and she affirms his role as Messiah and his mission to the Jews first. What is she saying by her response to him? By not just giving up, but that response, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's bread. In essence, she's saying, listen, I know who you are. People back in your own country don't believe you are who you are. We've already seen that with Pharisees and leaders who refuse to acknowledge who he is. She is saying, listen, I know who you are. I know why you came and whom you came initially. And I'm not asking you to abandon any of that. I understand I have no claim on you. I understand I have no rights. But comparatively, I'm just a little begging dog <laughs> under the table, patiently begging, and Lord, I'll take even just one crumb from you. What faith. What faith. And what's Jesus do? What's Jesus' response? Ding, 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 ding. That's awesome. I can't find that kind of faith back home. You nailed it. You understand your place. You understand your need. You know who I am. You come to me in reverence. You're desperate for me. That's the kind of person I want to reward. That's the kind of person I want to bless. And he does. And he heals. He delivers this girl from demonic oppression, from a distance. He doesn't go to her home, sit by her bed, do some fancy exorcist prayer. He doesn't say, bring her to me. He just speaks it. How many of you know with one word? <laughs> one word from the Lord at the right time. You've been there, you've done that. You've been there in that place of hurt, desperation, disillusionment. And at just the right time, you either open the book and you get it yourself and the Lord lights it up for you. 
or you have a friend on the phone or a friend across a, a table in a coffee shop and he shares that one word from the Lord and suddenly, <laughs> suddenly all the gloom blows away. Suddenly there is light. Suddenly there is the glimmer of hope that comes in. Jesus. She knew Jesus was the answer. She recognizes it. And with one word, this little girl is delivered. Let me give you four quick takeaways. Four quick takeaways. I'm going to move super, super quick. First of all, Jesus is a Savior for everybody. He's the Savior for everybody. Some of you say, man, you don't know my boss. <laughs> you don't know my neighbor two doors down. You don't know about their parties. You don't know how blasphemous he is. You don't know. He's not just indifferent towards God. Man, he is rebellious, openly rebellious towards God. Have you seen the stuff he tweets? Have you seen the stuff that she does and all of that? Jesus is Savior for everybody. There is not one person whose heart is so hard-shelled that he cannot break through. Some of you are hard-shelled people. and Some people were probably thinking, Lord, I'm done with them. But you know what the Lord knew about you, though you have a hard shell? You got a warm, chewy center. <laughs> that he knew, I'm going to get this person. He loves it. He loves these kind of things. And so here we find that he is a savior for everybody. Maybe you're here today as a guest. Maybe you're watching online, and, and he's a savior for you. He is the savior. He's the only one out there. And, and today, his name is Jesus Christ. And if you'll humble yourself, and you'll come to him with a contrite heart, and you'll recognize, man, I have sinned against this holy God. And you ask him for forgiveness and you claim him as Lord. And you trust him that way. He'll take you just as you are. No matter what you've done, no matter who you've hurt. I like, I've, I've hurt a lot of people in my life. He'll take you as is. I told you growing up in town and country, we didn't have uh, many, many nice things. My dad was a, we were a single in, uh, income family. Dad was a cabinet maker, an immigrant from Germany. And uh, we lived paycheck to paycheck. And, uh, and as we were um, uh, getting the house, and, and mom could make any house, any living place a, a, a home. And we would go to, uh, after church, uh, we would go, uh, it's not there any longer, up on Gandhi, Levitt's. Anybody remember Levitt's? Some of you from South Tampa, some of you born and raised, Robinson High School grads and stuff, and uh, there was a place called Levitt's, and we, it was funny, after church we would go to Levitt's because mom wanted to look at some things, and we would walk right through the showcase. You know, they'd have representatives there saying, hey, can we help you? Let me show you these nice showcases, and mom would just say, we're going to the as is. As is was in the back. As is was like, it wasn't even nice. It just like, it said as is in a cheap sign, and it was just like a, a, a plywood partitioned off. <laughs> and it was furniture other people had like dropped, and, uh, <laughs> and that's where we went, you know. We, we, we. Jesus today will take you as is. Some of you have been dropped. Some of you would say, man, I, if I was God, I wouldn't want me. I come with so much baggage. He will. He'll take you as is. Here's the second thing, is that Jesus commends persevering faith. Are you keep, do you keep knocking? One thing I know about you, too, some of you I haven't met yet, here's what I know, is you have a need today. Some of us say, well, you know, I, I only take my big needs to Jesus. No, we're to take everything to Jesus. We're to cast all our cares on him. Why? Because he cares for us, right? And so, it's important that we recognize that he commends, he rewards, he acknowledges and responds to persevering faith. Whatever it is you're praying for, listen, whoever it is you're praying for, don't give up, don't give up, don't give up, don't give up. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, don't give up. Third thing. Jesus can do all things. Some of you say, man, I know that. I've got that on a bumper sticker. Do you really know that? Do you really know that? Jesus can do all things. Impossible is not in his vocabulary. So whatever it is, don't give up. And keep hanging on to the horns of the altar. And, and remember, man, he can do all things. And then lastly, and I'm so glad, is that Jesus offers us far more than crumbs. 
she said, man, I'm happy with a crumb that falls off the table. A crumb is enough for me, Jesus. But Jesus offers you and me so much more than just crumbs. Psalm 23 said he prepares a table for us. <laughs> a banquet in the midst of our enemies. Amazing. Revelation 19 says that that we're washed in the blood of Jesus and that someday we'll attend this amazing event of all events called the marriage supper of the Lamb. What's that going to be like? Jesus, I'm just, I'm, uh, you don't have to do anything else for me, Jesus. How many of you know if Jesus didn't do anything else for you, it's already enough? I'd still come to church. I'd still praise him. I'd still do all of these different things. He has done more than enough for me. And yet he says, no, I keep doing things. Not only do I give you entrance into glory, but I'm going to give you a seat in glory at my right hand. Whoa, we don't talk about glorification enough in the church. <laughs> He's going to share his glory with us. Jesus, no, that what you did was already so gracious and merciful. And he said, man, you haven't seen anything yet. How wonderful. I'm the God who gives you more than crumbs. I'm a lavishing God. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Today we're here worshiping a lavishing God. He doesn't just dish out his blessings with an eyedropper, but with a fire hose. We're under the spout where the glory comes out, man. We're like standing under Horseshoe Niagara Falls with a NyQuil cup, trying to get a drink. <laughs> How blessed we are. Of the Lord and so it's important it's important that he gives us more than that friends you have a great need for Christ and you have a great Christ for your need Isn't that beautiful Isn't that beautiful this is the good news we believe every man woman and child in the Bay Area needs to hear this news not only are, do we are we distributors of this news, but each one of us are satisfied customers? <laughs> and today, if you haven't received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, would you make that commitment today? Would you surrender? Would you just surrender? I had to get to a place where I just surrendered. And I won't go into the gory details. I know you've got places to go, people to see lunches to consume. But I remember when it all turned around. I was living in shame. I was living back with my mom and stepdad, a place I never thought I'd be living in again. I remember coming home one night, their home, the home I grew up in, the home that they graciously allowed me to come back to. I remember one night coming home and going into my old room, and it's my old room. It's my kiss poster. humiliated and ashamed and ashamed of what my life had become how my priorities were upside down the misery I was putting other people in and through in my life I came in and mom and Tom both are in glory now God bless them I said Steve you want to watch some TV with us and I said man I was I was too depressed. I just said, man, I'm just going to go to my room, go to bed. And I went back to my room, and I turned on a little black and white portable television. And I don't know who it was. And it was one of those TV preachers, who probably now I don't believe in or endorse. <laughs> <laughs> but that night, on that program, in that moment, God used the TV preacher who preached just the right thing I needed to see and I needed to hear. And I laid there in the bed and God 
penetrated my soul. And I began to weep. Anybody, anybody, how many of you know there's a difference between crying and weeping? <laughs> and I began weeping. And I'm there in the dark, and I'm like, man, I hope they don't hear me out in the living room because I am just like, am I losing it right now? And I just began crying out to the Lord to forgive me. God, I'm so sorry. What a mess. I've been driving my life, and, and, and all I do is run it off cliffs. And I'm causing all this problem and all this misery, and I'm, God, I'm so sorry, and I know better than that. And I just began weeping and weeping to the point where I literally rolled off of my twin bed onto the shag carpeting. This is how long that was. Onto the shag carpeting, and in a fetal position, cried for at least two hours. I woke up in the morning. And I knew, as soon as I opened my eyes, something had changed. That I was no longer the same person again. I knew that God had done something in me. Now I say that, yes, to be one of those real people I always try to solicit. But all I know is that when we come to him with a repentant heart, when a broken heart, is that he can do the heart surgery. He can do the transformation. He can do the healing that only he can do. And maybe there's somebody here today, and that's you today. And whether you have a kiss poster or not, that's you today. By the way, I've repented for my kiss years. And, uh, <laughs> but all I know is that God changed me that night. When I came to him with a broken heart, he changed me. And I believe he still does that in people's lives. And so whatever you need, and we all need something, we're all praying for somebody, we're all praying about something, as your brother, as your pastor, as your friend, let me encourage you not to give up. One crumb from the table of God is enough to change your life. One word from God's mouth can change your life. And it changed mine. And if he changed my life, he can change your life too. I was happy being a banker. I never thought I would do this. Never wanted to do this. Sometimes I don't want to do this. But the first step in the plan was to capture my heart. Does he have your heart today? I pray he does. Let me pray, and then we're going to sing. Father, I pray if there's anybody here today that doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, that, Father, today would be their day of salvation. Father, I pray as we continue to think about what's going on in our lives and the people around us and the people that we love, Father, would you forgive us for the times that we just throw up our arms and give up so easily when we know you're the only one who loves us like you do and can do what we can't do. Father, I pray for greater desperation in the body of Christ. Father, I thank you that you can clean things that we can't. I thank you for changing my life, Lord Jesus. And God, I know you can do it for all the people in this room right now or watching online. Lord, we love you so much. Thank you for loving us like this. We lift this up in your name and for your glory, Jesus. Amen.